Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is light, specifically ultraviolet light. And with me here in the studio is Dr. Dale Parton from the Warren Astronomical Society. Uh, Dale, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, I understand that you've been studying ultraviolet light. Uh, can you tell our viewers why you're interested in this subject? Sure. Um, I'm a scientist and also an amateur astronomer, and I enjoy studying things that you can't see with your naked eye. Um, often use instruments to see things, and you can't see ultraviolet or UV light. And um, there are a lot of things in astronomy that you can see with ultraviolet that you can't otherwise see. And I'm also interested in the health effects which are very important of ultraviolet light. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Right. Um, if we can have the next image, please. Um, you know, nature is full of things that are very beautiful with many different colors that our eyes can see. Uh, but there are other colors we can't see. Uh, if you look at the next uh, image, um, our eye can see what we call, obviously, visible light. That means we're especially sensitive to green and yellow light. Uh, but as you go to longer wavelengths on the right side of this image, uh, through orange and then red, uh, our eye is much less sensitive. And then you get to what we cannot see. It's called infrared. On the other side of the spectrum of light, as you go from green to blue to violet, our eye can hardly see violet at all. And you go beyond that, and you're into the thing I've been studying, which is UV or ultraviolet light. Uh, if you go to the next image, um, there are insects, however, that can see uh, ultraviolet light. Uh, and some birds can as also. And I have to think, nature must look much more beautiful to them because they can see uh, so many additional colors. So, but the first part, the visible spectrum, we were uh, talking about what we humans can see with our, right. our range of vision. But uh, with uh, the insect world, such as bees and even some mm -hmm. birds, uh, they tend to go into that uh, ultraviolet range. Right. right. Uh, now, that really is, is quite fascinating. I never really thought that insects or other you know, creatures mm -hmm. could do that. Uh, now, you also said that you're an amateur astronomer and uh, was wondering how is ultraviolet light useful in astronomy, the study of astronomy? Okay, if, uh, if we can look at, uh, I mean, before we go there, uh, one more image just to show you the difference of what we see, the mm -hmm. yellow flower, and the same flower as a bee might see it, showing different ultraviolet colors that a bee can see, that those colors have been translated into the visible so we can see them. So, you know, flowers, maybe they have these UV colors so, so that they attract insects to them to pollinate them. Looks like a target. Yeah. The one on the right, yeah. <laughs> you know, fly here. So if we look at the next image, um, you asked about what you can do in astronomy. Uh, here's an image of the sun taken by NASA, a NASA satellite, just looking at ultraviolet light and then transferred into the visible so we can see it. And there's a lot of structure there that's much easier to see with ultraviolet light than with visible light. What are we seeing there in this image? Well, you're seeing uh, streamers of ions coming out of the sun. Um, but let's go to the next image. Uh, this is Saturn seen from uh, in the ultraviolet transferred to the visible. Saturn, when I look at it through a telescope, the colors are not nearly as vivid. No, it's very beige. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, here, uh, when this image is analyzed scientifically, uh, you can learn a lot about the composition of Saturn's atmosphere, the clouds that are going around Saturn, and the temperatures of it. Um, if Does it show not only temperature, you mentioned chemical composition. Yes. Uh, could they get wind speeds? Uh, uh, yes, although that, that's even more challenging. You get that, uh, for example, from Doppler shifts, from tiny little changes in the wavelengths of the light. All righty. Uh, anything else in the uh, area of astronomy? 
Uh, let's look at the next image. Uh, this shows uh, what the light of the sun is as a function of wavelength. Uh, uh, longer wavelengths to the right, shorter wavelengths getting into the ultraviolet to the left, and the yellow curve is uh, the intensity of sunlight at each different wavelength before it comes down into the Earth's atmosphere, and the blue curve is uh, the intensity once it's in the atmosphere. You have the infrared colors that we cannot see off to the right, the visible in the middle, and on the left, you, you have the UV or ultraviolet colors, and you'll see UVA, UVB, and going to shorter wavelengths, UVC. Those are, those are the names of ultraviolet colors. They're not very imaginative. No, not like <laughs> indigo. Right, you know, right. It sounds so much right. better. But, you know, leave it to scientists to come up with these kind of names. But, so I'll be talking about UVA, UVB, and UVC. None of the UVC makes it down to the f surface of the Earth. So is in, that a function of the atmosphere, sort of? It's more absorbing at that shorter wavelength. Okay. So, so the only bands of UV that make it down here to the surface and that can affect us are UVA and UVB. So those are the two colors of UV that I set out to measure, plus I measured visible. And you can see my apparatus in the next slide. Um, this is something I put together. It has. Uh, off on the right, sticking up in the air, are um, a piece of wood with three sensors, um, one to measure visible, one for UVA, and one for UVB. And I had something I could point them exactly at the sun and a meter to measure the intensity, and all of this just out in my backyard. Uh, rather simple looking uh, setup. This was done last summer, I believe? Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the next image. Uh, this is the data, just example of data that I took uh, one day in August, starting early in the morning on the left side and uh, all the way toward e through evening. Uh, you can see uh, the various colors are different, uh, like the uh, green color is visible light, uh, the red is UVA, and the uh, blue is UVB. And then, so I took that data, and then the black dots are the UV index that you can get from your local uh, um, weather uh, website. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see where noon happened. It's labeled in red. And all of this was a little afternoon. Uh, Why is that? that? You think it would be right at noon, noon, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, it's partly because in August we're on daylight savings time, so that shifts things one hour late, plus... We're not in the center of the eastern time zone. So we're off on the western side. So that also delays when true local noon happens. Mm -hmm. And so what, what those curves say is if you want to avoid getting too much exposure to UV light, you want to be out either quite early in the morning, say before 9 o'clock, or late in the day, like 6 o'clock. Uh, for 6, 6.30, the UV index is down to 1 or 0, and you don't have to worry about getting overexposed to UV light. I see. Uh, I, I wait till 6 or 6.30 to go out and cut the grass, okay? Mm -hmm. That uh, would really seem to be uh, a smarter time to do it, especially since we're going to talk in the next part of the, uh, the show about the medical side effects of right. uh, ultraviolet light. Uh, this is really a good time to uh, take a break. Uh, if you uh, would like to learn more, please go to our website. It's astronomyforeveryone.org. You can see it down there at the bottom of your screen. And right after our break for term of the month, we'll be back with more of this conversation on ultraviolet light. The term of the month for June 2013 is ultraviolet light. Now, back in February, I talked about the history of light, uh, and I got, I got us up to about the mid-1600s. Uh, so for this, uh, for this talk about ultraviolet light, uh, I once again looked up electromagnetic radiation on Wikipedia, you know, for some light reading. And the story picks up in about 1800 with William Herschel. He demonstrated that if you take a prism and you shine the light of the sun through the prism and 
you stick a thermometer in the visible light, the thermometer goes up like you'd expect. But if you moved the thermometer off to the off the end of the red end of your rainbow of light, the thermometer still went up. And he, if you move it all the way out, it goes back down to regular room temperature. He also tried moving the thermometer off the blue end of the spectrum, and the thermometer didn't rise. But he did essentially uh, discover infrared light. Uh, he called it something else, but it eventually be called, it became called infrared. And the reason why he didn't discover ultraviolet light is because his thermometer reflects ultraviolet light, and so it didn't, it didn't detect it. So we had to wait until 1801, a whole year later. Johann Wilhelm Ritter uh, prepared uh, silver chloride on a surface, and he showed that the silver chloride darkened on the, uh, past the blue end of the spectrum uh, from a uh, from a prism. Now, this was a very crude and early precursor to photography. And it also showed that light can cause a chemical reaction. And that is, in fact, how your eyes work, although your eyes are considerably more sophisticated than a little bit of silver chloride. And that is the term of the month for June 2013, ultraviolet light. Welcome back to our show. In the first part, we were talking about UV light and uh, when the best time was to uh, avoid the worst effects. Uh, so, Dr. Parton, if I uh, stay out of direct sunlight during midday, say if I'm under an awning or under a big umbrella, would I be safe from the effects of ultraviolet light? Uh, that's what you might think. Uh, and I was surprised, frankly, to find out that that's not the case. Staying in the shade, either of a beach umbrella or the side of your house or something under a tree, uh, is not enough. If, if we can look at the first image here, uh, I took some data in the shade of my house, uh, you know, out my backyard, um, and even though the sun was blocked by the house, uh, when I pointed my instrument up, uh, you know, close to vertical into the sky, I was still seeing 20% of the light I, I would see if I looked directly at the sun uh, in terms of UVA and UVB. Uh, so uh, that's a little surprising until you think that, well, the sky looks blue. Because right? light is being scattered through the right, molecules. Right. Even if you're in shade, you can look up and see blue sky because blue light, uh, the shorter wavelength light, is scattered more efficiently by uh, the sky, mm -hmm. and so ultraviolet is even shorter in wavelength, so it's scattered even more. So if we could see ultraviolet light, we might not say the sky looks blue. We might say the sky looks UVA or UVB, okay? Uh, so you're not safe just by being in the shade. Uh, we, are, we can get a suntan or a sunburn if you're out too long. Uh, even if you're in the shade of a beach umbrella or something the whole time. Um, if we can look at the next image. Um, well, that brings up my next question. What about a cloudy day? Would that yeah. shield us from the harmful effects of ultraviolet light? Uh, great question. Um, uh, here you see pictures uh, I took of the sky uh, when, as I was taking data. First on the left when the sun was shining right through a gap in the clouds, and then as the wind blew the clouds over the sun uh, when it was shaded, and I was still getting something like 15 percent of the UV uh, hitting us. If the sky is deeply, heavily overcast, it drops down to more like 10 percent or even 5 percent, but some is still getting through, and if you're out all day, even uh, under heavily overcast skies, yeah, you're getting a significant dose of UV. Wow. So uh, we do need uh do need to be careful. Um, what about, uh, well, what can our viewers actually learn or take away from uh, your data that you've been able to gather? If we can look at the next slide, uh, one of the things is not only are you not safe if you're in the shade or uh, 
if it's cloudy, but the question is, what if you're driving in a car? Okay, does the glass of the car uh, cut out the, the ultraviolet light for you? Uh, taking data just on my car, uh, uh, I found that uh, the, the front windshield basically takes out all of the UV, both A and B, but the side windows, while they took out UVB, they still let through UVA. UVB is the, the color that gives you a sunburn, but UVA will not give you sunburn, but it will long-term cause skin cancer. Uh -huh. so, so UVA matters too. If, so that's one thing I looked at, the effect of a glass on a car. If we look at the next slide, uh, I looked at eyeglasses. Okay. Uh, turns out an older pair of eyeglasses that I had, and that's obviously not me in the picture, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, an older pair, pair of eyeglasses that just had plain glass lenses let through a huge amount, roughly half or more of both UVA and UVB. I didn't know that. I, th I would have guessed it would have blocked them. Uh, on the other hand, I have a newer pair that has polycarbonate lenses that are doped with uh, a UV absorber, and that basically blocks both, all of both UVA and UVB. So it seems that the newer polycarbonate lenses are really more beneficial for eye health than right. the older glass type lenses. I also checked several types of plastic sunglasses mm -hmm. and, and I was surprised. Even sunglasses that do not tell you that they take out UV completely took out both UVA and UVB. So sunglasses uh, really help if you don't wear glasses that take out UV for you. Okay. Did we have an image on that? Uh, uh, no, we don't. Okay. Uh, that's a freebie. All right. <laughs> So, so here, here's a, a picture that makes the point. Yeah, we talked earlier about being under a large beach umbrella. Yeah. Uh, here's a picture of, of a mother and two kids out on the beach, but under a beach umbrella. And they're getting clobbered with UV even while they're in the shade. Uh, they're getting hit with UV any place they can see blue sky. Uh, around the edges of the umbrella, they're getting hit with UV plus uh, UV is bouncing off the ground, in this case sand, mm -hmm. and they're getting hit with UV that way. Sand will do it. The whiter the sand, the more it'll do it. Uh, grass will do it to some extent. Pavement will. Uh, the thing that's the most reflective is snow. That would uh, be the whitest. Yeah, it would be the whitest. And up to 80% of the UV that hits the, the snow will bounce off and uh, can give you a sunburn or a cumulative dose toward skin cancer. Well, that's my, uh, really my, the last big question that I have. Uh, can you tell us more about the uh, medical side effects of uh, ultraviolet light? Sure, let's look at the next uh, image. I almost hate to show these pictures, and I, I took pictures that weren't as bad as some. Okay. okay? <laughs> but it is a serious thing, and oh, so yeah. folks need to know what can, can possibly happen. Yeah. I mean, you know when you got a sunburn, right? Yes. That's from UVB. But this is what you get after a long-term, lifetime, from, from childhood, exposure to, to too much UVA. Uh, the top image shows the worst kind of cancer. It's called melanoma. And, and that can cause uh, skin cancer. That's not only skin cancer, but that can kill you re very easily. And notice it's on the top of the person's ear. Uh, just if the person had just worn a hat, not the kind with just a bill that sticks not out a in front of your face, cap, but, but, but a broad-brimmed hat, uh, their ear would have never gotten that kind of UV exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, the lower kind, there's several types of skin cancer you can get from UV exposure. Here's another kind shown in the lower slide. Uh, and your eyes can also, if, if you don't wear eye protection, uh, you can get cataracts, uh, and other eye uh, problems from too much exposure to UV. Uh, if you look at the next image, um, uh, I tried to make the point here that uh, these problems are especially acute for children. Uh, their skin is much more sensitive to the effects of UV. Uh, so, so the greatest risk is for children and especially fair-skinned children.
Okay. Uh, darker skin uh, children, the, the, the darkness of their skin shades their body. They have some built-in protection. Extent. Yeah, they have some built-in protection from the effects of UV. But <laughs> you can't count on that uh, for full protection because uh, you, you can, you know, a darker skinned uh, person, especially children, can be playing out in the sun all day and without realizing it, they won't get a sunburn necessarily, but their skin is getting too big a dose of UVA, and later in life, uh, they may wind up with skin cancer. Or could they even have just like a, a sensitivity rather than the burn that a lighter skinned person would have? Can, yes, but they can get sunburn too. Wow. Uh, wow. But, but again, the problem is worst for fair skinned children. Now, what, what can you do about this? The World Health Organization has several recommendations. Uh, one is just limit the time you're out in the midday sun. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to know that. Wear a broad-brimmed hat and sunglasses and use a, a sunscreen that says broad spectrum. Normal sunscreen, if it doesn't say that, it's only blocking UVB that causes sunburn, not UVA that can cause skin cancer. So important. Uh, that it says broad spectrum. Now this should be used by both children and adults, even though the children are more susceptible, we should all really use this, correct? That's correct. But children by far are at the greatest risk. Okay. Uh, this is really very good information. Uh, we always enjoy the astronomy, but the, the adverse medical effects effects of uh, ultraviolet light are really quite, uh, quite important. I would like to uh, thank you, Doctor, for being a part of our program today and bringing this information to our viewers. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, send us an email. You can see the email address uh, right down there at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next is What's Up in the Night Sky.
What's up in the night sky for June 2013? We'll start with the moons. On the 8th of June, the moon is new. Now this is on a Saturday, and the phases of the moon come about once per week. And on, in this month, they come on the weekend. On the 16th of June, the moon is in first quarter, so it's going to be up uh, in the evening, in fact, during the daytime, from about noon to midnight, so it's going to be an evening sort of uh, thing, and it's on a Sunday. On the 23rd of June, which is also a Sunday, the moon is full, and so it's up from sunset to sunrise, so all night long. And then on June 30th, which is also a Sunday, we have the third quarter, and so this is visible more from midnight into the morning. So often in the morning, when you get up in the morning, you can see the third quarter moon. Now, Saturn is going to be up in the sky from sunset until about 2 a.m. and Saturn dominates the sky. It's quite bright and the rings are tilted over and they're gorgeous looking. Saturn is in Virgo and it lies on a line between Spica in Virgo and Zubinesh, Zubinesh Shamali, which is a great name to say. I mean, you know, just practice it. It's right on a, almost on a line. And Saturn is very bright, so I'm not talking about this to find Saturn. Um, really, it's more the, the slightly dimmer stars in Libra that I'm interested in here. So Zubinesh Shamali is the northern claw. Saturn is also a, just above a line between the other main bright star in Libra, Zubin al and um, and Spica, so another great thing. This is the Southern Claw, and they're called the Northern and Southern Claw because the entire constellation of Libra used to be part of Scorpius, which you can see to the lower left of Libra. So uh, it turns out that Zubin al the the Southern Claw there on the right, um, is in a small telescope. It is a double star. But it turns out that each of the stars are double stars in and of themselves that you can't really see in a telescope. And, there, and it's probably a five-star system, about 77 light years away. Now, Venus and Mercury are also visible. And on the 12th, when this picture is taken, or this planetarium program is shot from, Mercury is as high as it gets above the sun. So it's 15 degrees above the sun. This is the best time to look for Mercury, right after sunset. So it's more or less where the sun sets. By the end of the month, Mercury is only six degrees above the sun, so it's going to be much, much harder to see, whereas Venus will still be quite high in the sky. It's getting higher. And you can see that on the 12th, you have a sliver of the moon to the upper left of uh, Mercury and Venus. So that's what's up in the night sky for June 2013.